so you were in town. You did a photo shoot, but well, we're not going to talk about that too much. But it was outdoors, though, uh, <laughs> in December. Yes. So Is it don't... December yet? It's December. Oh, my God. Is you're it... right. <laughs> well, it's just like the day after Thanksgiving happens and everything's like Christmas, like, Christmas, yeah. Christmas. Uh, it is true. It is funny. In my mind, it is yeah. December. But as we're recording this, I guess technically we're still in November. But it was but it's cold. So you 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 it's don't cold. mess around. You do your work and you are into your work. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I love it. I don't feel that I work ever. That's why I think that it's just easy to be like, oh, let's go into a like last week I was in just a nightgown and I did a photo shoot in um, Connecticut in uh, like a potter's field at 5 a.m. And it was so <laughs> cold. It was so, But the photos are amazing. And so it was worth it. Where is that? So photographers must love working. Uh, let's put it this way. I'm sure there are models who are higher maintenance where it's a little bit more difficult and you have to deal with the whims of the model. Mm -hmm. perhaps or they have like certain things in their contracts like <laughs> i must have green m&ms i don't know anyone like that <laughs> but i'm sure that it i'm sure that those people exist but i've been really fortunate where every model that i work with and i mean we have an understanding and there's like little things written down in contracts and all of that being like you know don't work them overtime without more money you need a break there needs to be vegan options on set things like i mean <laughs> but nothing that's like too out of control and no there were no vegan options in this potter's field mm. last week but i i made do okay so so <laughs> so okay so you are a model in front of the camera yeah and you do work behind the camera too or it is a film camera i guess um i right. have not i have not produced any photo shoots lately i mean some like film covers of films i've produced but um I've never been the photographer. I'm not a cinematographer. I'm a producer and a director on the other side. Yeah. Yes. Which I just fell into. Yeah. Well, how'd that work? Because, um, all right, well, we can go back because originally uh, you uh, are from Pittsfield, from Massachusetts, Pittsfield. and yeah. then you made that uh, leap. And, and again, you didn't decide, okay, well, I'm going to go into you know, could be an attorney or a nurse or, uh, <laughs> you know, a marketing consultant or something like that. You went to New York City and you were going to do this and uh, and you have done this. So um, take me into that, uh, you know, even yeah. going back, uh, originally just stepping foot there saying, what am I doing? How do I do this? How do I do this? <laughs> Well, I know that like going back, I mean, I grew up um, playing music with like Bill Chapman and Santa Broder through like elementary school, through high school, played the clarinet and I'm um, still do. And the nice. um, and then in high school at Taconic, it was well, it was Cara Demler at Berkshire Children's Theater and then Jess Passetto, of course, who helped with like Shakespeare and Company and the Spring Musical. And they both basically were like the foundation points of like why. I was, I was like, mm -hmm. dust thou must that do, Lady Macbeth So says. often. I mean, yes. uh, Jess Pacetto <laughs> is probably, is just that anchor, is that she uh, is. inspiration yeah. for a lot of uh, people. There's a handful of you that came out of that generation. The golden uh, era of Taconic Theater. <laughs> I'm not even joking. It's true. It is true. <laughs> it's us. Um, yeah, no. So between Kara and Jess and then Bill and Senta, I was like, I think I need to do Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> do people make careers in Shakespeare? Yes, they do. Let's do that. And I know that um my parents, um, Paul and Sharon, they wouldn't uh they wouldn't let me go to New York if they didn't think I could do it. So um yeah, getting there, I mean, picking a school, getting into like a really difficult program that then that year, uh the BFA program at Marymount Manhattan College became number one in the country. Mm. So it was cool. It was really, really great. And it was rigorous. And I was like, what am I doing here? <laughs> you know it's, it's very much that like the whiplash of being the big fish in yeah the well it's, all, it's and... also not like going to a normal maybe school and you're a theater major or something like yeah. that this is you're you, you're all in oh, once you yeah. get to that <laughs> yes no i mean it was great because it was a liberal arts college too so they made you take unfortunately everything <laughs> but no it was great the um, program was wonderful the professor just take math great. I did. Yeah, we used to terrible at math. <laughs> I remember where I went to school. They used to have this program or this uh, class. They used to call it math for poets or something. It was like literally the one that that the liberal arts people had to take to you know just yeah. to get their 
Yeah, but it was like other people even in my program, in my acting program, would be, you know, in top level math class. <laughs> and I'd be over here in the corner like, PEMDAS. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. I've made do. I've made do. Math is kryptonite. It is. Sometimes, for some people. It is. And now like running, I run, I have two production companies and um, and now balancing books and dealing with numbers yeah numbers like um, but i feel like balancing books is a lot different than once you get into the sort of algebraic stuff and you know all that i mean balancing books is actually really easy comparatively because it's (laughs) you have money in money out yeah yeah you, hopefully you have more in before and then everything's you can write out stuff i love writing things <laughs> up. it's so cool right <laughs> yeah i can write this photo shoot off great <laughs> this is wonderful life is good that's math right. is hard that's right <laughs> that's when you can have first. a good accountant have that's a good right. yes yes then. that's that's next that's next on the agenda <laughs> i need an assistant and i need an accountant clearly maybe they can do both uh, yeah yeah that would be that would be amazing ideal that would be amazing put it put an ad out on craigslist i swear oh i yeah. um i'm not even joking come on <laughs> you, you think i'm every you look at me like everything i'm saying is ironic no, <laughs> like, no, no. that's just how i, I live a, my life i put an ad out for a web developer i just put 25 bucks on i mean i can't stop getting uh messages from web developers from all over the world you know? like yeah, yeah i'm like okay 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 I get it. I get it. Um, you got to sift through the candidates. So, yeah, no, that's, and that is a lot of work. Yeah. And that's a lot of work. So it's kind of like, all right. And then there you go. But there you go. Get your accountant. You're doing it. I actually, I just directed an off Broadway premiere of a show um, called Alice Again about him, um, about Lewis Carroll, uh, Reverend Charles Dodson. And um, basically, his characters come to life and put him on trial for moral impropriety. And so, and I wanted everything to be very um, time appropriate. And everyone kept saying, Chelsea, just go to Craigslist. Just go to Craigslist. And I'm like, nah. Uh, but I did. <laughs> and did it go well? I did. Yes, yes. I got this beautiful chaise lounge from 1870. It's interesting because everybody, there's a lot of pretenders out there. Yeah. You know, Facebook has their marketplace. Oh my God, Facebook and everybody, marketplace. All this stuff. But like at the end of the day, I mean, Craigslist was the, was the the pinnacle was the original yes you know, the or OG. something <laughs> the og um yeah no you go craigslist this is how this is now a podcast about craigslist <laughs> exactly under underwriting support yes. uh craigslist uh but you Sponsored play some by. so you you play some dark characters i mean i don't well, i guess it's all relative, I suppose. I mean, if you have a yeah. full array of characters, you know, every right. actor wants to have the full scope. It's true. But uh, maybe maybe you lean toward those or have, have, have found some uh, uh, niche. There. I think that I'm lucky where people believe in me that I can play those roles, you know, mm-hmm. because it's so easy to just... No, nothing's easy. But um, <laughs> nothing that's worth it is easy. But... You know, everyone wants to play, you know, the high school cheerleader. So, and I'm like, I'll play the high school cheerleading coach who accidentally gets murdered. Like, <laughs> like that's what they think I'm going to do. Um, yeah, I accidentally fell into the horror genre. Mm. Um, didn't ask for it, but it gave me what notoriety I have now, and I was able to springboard from that and like start production companies. Um, one of my companies, CL Squared Productions. We have everything we do is kind of horror based. And um, there's a movie that you can buy on DVD and Blu-ray. that's not for the faint of heart. Um, Then I came in as a producer and one of the composers in post-production. I'm not in it, but it's a lesbian vampire film. And you can buy it at Barnes & Noble and Amazon, all of that. And we're going to be back on streaming, hopefully by the end of the year. And um, that is kind of how it all started and then there is a book written by charles lincoln my uh, production company partner um, yeah i see that name pop up quite a bit so that's your yeah the, this lincoln is like this lincoln <laughs> this lincoln there <laughs> yes um yeah no charles d lincoln he um in my, he's my partner in cl squared productions because charles lincoln chelsea lesage gotcha. um uh and he wrote a novel called 21st century demon hunter and was like you're perfect for to like pose for the poster for or like the book cover and i was like okay great and then i was like why don't you make this a web series and then he did and he came up with like 12 scripts in two days and we shot it the first season back in 2017 got an amazon deal um 
and started to have this like fan base and then we're actually releasing that the first season and then our season 1.5 which i think we're calling the season of fire that um that is also coming out soon as so well and the you demon hunter me. i am the demon hunter you are the demon hunter I'm the de- Hunter. So tell me, I mean, does this, uh, well, okay. Um, first of all, there's a couple of things that like pop in my head as far as, I mean, there's always, um, the arc it's, it's perfect for a series because, yeah. you know, there's probably an endless number of demons out there yes. to, to hunt. Maybe. Yeah. I don't mm-hmm. know. <laughs> no, it's true. Sometimes uh, you have several demons in an episode or in one episode in the first season, it's like a holiday Christmas thing, but the demons are like the ones inside of her mind mm-hmm. and depression, <laughs> you know, it's, um, it's really, it's really fun. And it's, it's horror comedy, lots of blood, lots of gore, um, live for it. And she, but the demon hunter, she comes from a long line and Julie Golightly, a long line of demon hunters, but she cares more about, um, like frivolity and drinking and being social to keep it PG, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, then, then really actually fighting the forces of evil. Mm. And then the second season gets really dark. And from there we started this movie Bishop's Cove where I play the demon. So, um, interesting. The, yes. So, well, okay. So the Bishop's Cove <laughs> yeah. is a different, yes, that's it's different. Our, okay. le- our latest venture in okay. horror. And we just wrapped principal photography on that and it's going to make the festival circuit so, t- next this, year. So the demons. All right. So we hear a lot about, you know, demons and I, I don't know how much have you delved into, uh, you know, have you researched like the the idea of what demons are like for you personally does that, is that like part what of... like what religion they come from i, I, I don't even know are. i mean is are, are they is are they tied to a religion or is there some universality uh to it um you know what do you I think that, I mean, what I love about Demon Hunter and about um, not necessarily my character, the Nameless and Bishop's Cove, but most demons, most demons, like I'm a, <laughs> like, like I'm some demonologist and some expert. Well, that's a, no, but they, are asking, tied you, to like, yeah. <laughs> they are generally tied to some sort of like religion or like mythos or mm-hmm. some book that can go back to ancient times to now, or it's different like cultural demons or, you know. I don't know. You think about like the chupacabra or things like different or different re- regions or like Bigfoot, things like that. Like you can go from like those aren't demons, of course, but then <laughs> delving into like like the Cthulhu mythos and everything from any sort of religion. And what I really like is that we've tried to kind of take these demons and keep them as accurate as possible. Um Yes, while throwing little twists based on, on the mythology yeah. or based okay okay yeah That's based on the mythology but then we'll like do a little silly twist on it where one of the demons that I fight is just a possessed cabbage patch doll. <laughs> <laughs> um. Uh. So it really it really depends, but I love playing these dark roles because it's such such a fun challenge and it's almost easier for me. And I think that it started with Shakespeare and Company where in high school I played Lady Macbeth and then I never stopped. I've played <laughs> her now seven or eight times. And I think and actually you're the go to my go to uh, like it, it, I mean so it, it, these are New York City productions. Yeah. These are yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um I just think that I'm like I have it's like, you know how you, when you think you're going to go and be an actor and people say, have a backup plan, have a backup plan. Luckily, I haven't. I never had one. But now my backup plan is I can just play Lady Macbeth for the rest of my right, life. Right. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> I've fallen in love with her over and over and over again. And no, there's actually my other production company, Golden Grand Piano. And my partner in that is Dan Gindon. He's the cinematographer and I direct everything that we do. We have... Um, a movie out on Tubi. It's on Tubi. I don't know. It's on like 12 different streaming services, but Tubi is the big it's hard one. hard to keep track. Right? <laughs> I need an assistant. <laughs> All this diversification. Yeah, I have to call my manager and be like, Vinny, it's time. I need an assistant. <laughs> but the, um, but it's called Macbeth, a cursed film. And that is with Stag and Lion Theater Company that I've been with. It's an off-Broadway theater company that I've actually been with since I was 19. And when COVID hit, all our the rest of our season got canceled obviously so we were like why don't we just put everything into a movie instead so we made a Macbeth movie and I directed that with Josh Cohen who's the founder of um of Stag and Lion Theater Company who I work with all the time like Mm -hmm. most of the shows I've done this year off Broadway have been with them like I played Beatrice and Much Ado About Nothing this year I played Lady Percy in the Henry Fours the Alice again, he was my Lewis Carroll. He was, I was Gonroll and he was King Lear. Like we just, we work so well together 
um, and have for a decade that I just, you know, he's helped me delve further into Lady Macbeth, which has somehow made, I guess, my life in horror so much easier because she's a nightmare. I can see, well, I mean, of course, <laughs> I mean, people love, you know, Shakespeare and company yeah. around here. I never think of, uh, of uh, performing there again here. Oh, in the yeah. Actually, I saw Kevin Coleman, um, who actually, God, I love Kevin Coleman, who's the head of education. And he actually wrote my letters of recommendation for college, which was really sweet. I ran into him recently and it was just kind of, I don't know, you, you idolize these people growing up and then they become your peers. And he was one of them where I was like, oh my God, is he going to remember me? And he was like, I stalk you on Facebook. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> not stuck, not stuck. I love you, Kevin. Um, but the, um, yeah, no. And I told him, I was like, I'd come back if I'm not booked, I'll come back and work for you guys. I mean, like, I'd love to. I would love. I feel. Love it. I mean, as you're speaking, it'd be kind of an interesting opportunity for because it's Shakespeare and Company is very traditional, right? Like yeah. everything they do is like by the book, and and I mean, you know, it it is what it is. But yeah. I mean, I think maybe they have an opportunity to kind of spice it up a little bit, you know, kind of do a different, up. yeah, a little spice, spice yes. up Shakespeare and Company. Spice up Shakespeare. <laughs> you can have Macbeth is played by the possessed Cabbage Patch doll. Well, yeah, hear me out. Like that. I'm just kidding. No, <laughs> <Break>. I'm, <laughs> I'm very, I'm very like, um. I'm very, I don't know. I don't know the exact word for it, but the off the top of my head right now, but I love traditional Shakespeare. Like I love being dressed in the, I'm I'm not one who tends to go for like, oh, let's set it in the seventies. Right. I don't, right. I don't much care for that. Do but. you think, do you think there's a greater, um, because there's such strict confines, it is a greater challenge in a way to do it in, in the traditional form. And, and, and you have that, and it's almost like, this is the baseline folks. And you have these actors and you say, okay, how does this actor play Macbeth right. within these strict confines and how can they make it come alive? Yeah. Understanding that you got these guardrails. Yeah. I mean, like, sure, sure. Um, the, absolutely. Um, it's also more fun. And I think that there's like, there's definitely a niche where people want to see you in, in Elizabethan garb and something like that. But then I think on the flip side of that, um, the confines are really the foundation and the tropes. These characters are what everything, you know, most things that are written since Shakespeare's time, you can tie something back to Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. So you can bring it back and flip it where um, he is the foundation for all of, you know, the lovers, the fighters, you know, uh, LGBTQ characters, things, different um, family rivals. So that's kind of a gift mm. because you are in this foundation that has started so many characters that you've loved in every part of your life, whether it's film, television, theater that you've been seeing forever. And they all tie back to Shakespeare. Mm. So it's kind of freeing more so than like viewing them as guardrails. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Do you think Shakespeare was a person or do you think he was? Yes, I think Shakespeare was a person. He was, a, he was an individual person. <laughs> best friend I know. I'm... I fight. My best friend that I fight about, he's like, he didn't write those. I'm like, no, be quiet. <laughs> yes, he did. <laughs> There's no way of knowing, but I'm like, I don't know. I think that maybe Two Noble Kinsmen <laughs> wasn't written by him. It's like the one thing in my life that people could be like, People could show me literal facts <laughs> of Chelsea. Had, there was a team they, of writers. They, they, like there was a Saturday Night Live. Like, but... <laughs> like I flipped the table. Like I'm leaving. It's the one thing in my life <laughs> where I'm like, nope, 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 not here. <laughs> he was a man, a singular man. A singular man. <laughs> I didn't even know this. Was, I found out recently that there were like nine, something like nine years of his life where he just, that are completely undocumented and nobody knows what he was doing, yeah. where he was. And I'm like, I have to do research. Yeah. Where it, do you think he was, Chelsea? Writing all of this. It's interesting. I don't know. <laughs> the mystery. Like, you know, was, uh, I mean, did they, did he, did they bring him back? Was he zombie Shakespeare? Zombie you Shakespeare. Know? Yep. Or, you know, maybe mm -hmm. that was the. <laughs> the team of writers that became ah uh, see yes uh, yeah you know. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so anyhow just throwing it out there <laughs> i go on I go on these talk shows and i wind up talking about shakespeare the whole time <laughs> <laughs> do the talk show host loves talking about shakespeare well, i mean they do, they do they i usually get cut off <laughs> i'm just kidding that hasn't happened but um but shakespeare has really been the i guess the foundation is the word of the show i guess um of why I do what I do, mm. I guess. And it's just made my life so cool.
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Was it Lady Macbeth that did it for you? I think it was Lady Macbeth and kind of growing into her over the years. Because like I said, I think now professionally, it's been like seven or eight times and I'm 30. So that's really cool mm. to have gotten to have done that so many times. And um, I learn. It's like a new version of her every time I do. I did it with Josh Cohen after we did the movie in 2020. Um, then we did it at Stag and Lion and we got extended by the Broadway League. And that was really cool. Um, and it's just kind of she, I grow into her mm. every time. And then I take mm. a little bit of her with me when I'm playing these like darker roles on film. Now, how does the New York City living culture filter into your art because i i feel like i mean there is a certain culture right yes. so mm-hmm. I, I, when you go to new york city especially in the beginning mm-hmm. like you have no money yeah. you're paying ridiculous rent yeah, yeah and you're probably living with like 15 people or oh something or whatever it was it was um i had there were seven of us in a two-bedroom my freshman dorm yeah in the most expensive dorm in the country and i was like i'm sorry yeah you probably looked at it like per square foot you're paying more than any, anything. I, I, it's, it's, I was in the top bunk and God, the woman who lived below me, that's a whole like three hour conversation. Never mind. <laughs> but um, no, sounds I, like a great two person play. It really does. Yeah. And then right they wind there. up murdering each other. I'm just kidding. <laughs> She's fine. Um, the, <laughs> but um, the, no, I think that New York City, you have to, you have to grow up real quick. Um, because, you know, I had the best upbringing, the best family, you know, yeah. the Thompsons, the Les Ages, I, the, just the best. And I've always basically gotten to do and have excelled at everything I wanted to do growing up here, except for math. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, I, and so I got really fortunate. I got really fortunate that I got to do everything. And then I, you know, but I still felt like a kid moving there. And yeah. It, hardened you really really fast i became very facetious very quickly which is what you see today um <laughs> but it's good it's benefited me um, and then you have to hustle you have to hustle you have to make connections a lot of it is talent but a lot of it's just luck yeah um and, and hustling because the hustling makes the luck yes uh you know but it, it's interesting yeah i mean that whole thing and then i mean i mean have you been able to find <laughs> this sort of equilibrium or this sort of balance or peace you know or is it like um like a chaotic peace like you know what i'm saying i i was like you have to find peace in the chaos was gonna be my answer there you go yeah yeah i wouldn't have it any other way right because yeah. some people like i feel like you're one of those people that's like there it is like i am this is the way that my life is i i want this excitement because there are a lot of people i'm most people who would probably be like okay they could maybe try it but this is too much, you know, I yeah. need some, I need some stability because there's no, st- there's not stability there. Right. Oh, it's God, like, it's, no. it's the next, it's I'll the be, next production. It's the next, yeah. this I'll be on and a photo shoot and I, you know, I'll be my call time. will be 10 PM. I wrap at 8 AM and then I have to be on another set at noon. Um, and then I won't have anything for three days where I'm just like editing a movie and sitting mm-hmm. in my office and <laughs> there's no schedule. So it's not for everyone. Yeah. Unless you're like a series regular on a, on like a big network show, which is what my manager and I are trying for mm-hmm. next, next year. I actually have to take some time off. Um, I'm not going to take any time off, but I <laughs> tore my, I tore my ACL in April. Oh, no. I did. I tore my ACL in April, headbanging to Aerosmith in a play and <laughs> Um, and, uh, I have to, what was the song? Uh, mama can. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hey, if yeah. you're going to tear your ACL, <laughs> but I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, triggered. I'm like triggered. I'm like, don't say the name of the song. Chelsea. No, it was great. It was Gordon Sorry. Farrell. No, it's all your all the time. Um, Gordon Farrell's girls who walked on glass and he just wrote the Lewis Carroll play too. And he had this play on Broadway called, um, a lifespan of a fact with like Terry Jones and Bobby kind Valley and Daniel Radcliffe. And then um, he was one of my professors and then he just keeps hiring me. So that's great. That's good. Um, but I haven't had time to get the surgery done because thank you, God, I've just been booked all year mm-hmm. and I'm bad. I'm not wearing my knee brace right now, but I was like, I'm just going to be sitting down. What's the worst that could happen? <laughs> oh man. Um, But I have to have surgery. And then, mm. so I will actually be here in Pittsfield for six weeks, mooching off of my poor mother. Hey, um, cause I can't I'm take sure she loves it. She, yes. 
I love you, mom. <laughs> um, because uh, I won't be able to take care of myself for like a month, so I will be I will be here. And then my uh, I have this wonderful team of agents and managers who are working towards them, like um, having that normal schedule, meaning like being on a film set full time. For I actually I have this great movie coming up called Thus Always to Tyrants that we're going to shoot in this summer. And we have some like pretty cool big people attached to it that I will be in and I'm producing it. Um, mm. It's about John Wilkes Booth. And there's actually the play version of that called The Confession of John Wilkes Booth that I directed is also on Tubi that you can watch for free. Yeah. Yeah. And in that I play like a debutante's daughter, you know, who was engaged secretly to John Wilkes Booth and was with him the night of the assassination of Lincoln. Mm. So in that, here I am just like, oh, no, it was me crying when I had just played Lady Macbeth. Um, so it's really fun to just completely, and it was a couple so the confession. Later. So what I mean, yes. um, tell me about that a little bit. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I, I really like this because a lot of your material, um, is history. I mean, I know the demon thing. But I mean, it's like it's kind of, <laughs> but it's actually you know the, it you seem to tie it to realness. You know, it's realness. not like just it's not just you know yeah. um completely um you know untrue or there there's there's fiction, completely fictional that's the word so i can tie that into the confession of john wilkes booth and then thus always to tyrants as well which is um which is the english translation of six semper tyrannis which is what booth said right before he pulled the trigger um but so <laughs> i can try truth into that i mean i sound absolutely crazy if i say that no this is um uh nonfiction and all of this but we're actually um kind of rewriting history with the confession of john wilkes booth and then the major motion picture tyrants coming up where um we have diary entries from john wilkes booth and um uh have his descendants are backing us where basically what everyone is told i mean oh no public schools never teaching american history wrong no um but what you think <laughs> is that he was shot by boston corbett um in garrett's barn a couple of days after the assassination as he was trying to uh flee and it wasn't him okay it wasn't him he it was a guy named james william boyd who was actually uh helping him cross the potomac and escape down south and he actually lived to be 65 years old and went that under, looks booth yes Really? And went under different names like David E. George and Jesse Smith and Trevor. That sounds all to me over. like there was then then the then he was part of a wider conspiracy. It was. And what were um, So he was protected yes. by some powerful According interests. According to Mary Todd Lincoln and some of her diary entries, it was Vice President Johnson who put Booth up to the assassination. Mm. So we kinda and we have like weird tidbits from the booth and the wilkes families and um, yeah yeah so, i mean like common conspiracy theory, yeah. theories say that he was really shot not because of the civil war or anything like that it was uh, how the had to do uh, with money with the yeah with the um you know uh the greenback and yeah, yeah. and all that so um but that's basically we do yeah. we, i mean we had fascinating diary entries and then he was in Enid, oklahoma and just like confessed and um uh and killed himself with strychnine in his hotel room and i just i remember when the writer john remain pitched this to me i was like what this is insane and it was like you know what let's just let's just see what the script is like fell in love with it shot it at the stag and lion theater and then we got bob johnston who's this wonderful director and um line producer attached to to the major motion picture so we're gonna shoot that so i will have a normal schedule normal film schedule but so, working every so day the confessions coming are coming when he is John Wilkes Booth disguised as other people. Yeah, he like married different people, had kids with a bunch of different. So it's people. when the confessions are coming when he's older. Yes. Okay. Correct. So there's like an old Booth, and the um, old Booth, the old Booth, <laughs> and John Romain is brilliant. Um, he played Booth as well, and he's really brilliant in it. And then so that was also Golden Grand Piano, Dan and I's production company. And we are um, reprising. I'm reprising my role of Lucy Hale in the major motion picture, which I'm really excited about. It's awesome. So that'll be in Savannah next year. We're going to shoot that. And we have really cool people that I can't tell you yet who's attached to it. Cool. Yeah, I know. Love it. Love it. It's exciting. Yeah, it's life exciting. is good, man. <laughs> life is so random. <laughs> it is. So tell me, yeah. uh, the, now the modeling. Yes. Because you, know, you do a lot of photo shoots. Um, yeah. Tell me about that. Uh, industry and sort of your niche uh in that you know because you're not the 
conventional yeah. model. I don't know. Is that, you know, well, you, you have a look. I have a look. <laughs> I have a look. I'm not a size zero. I like food. Um, <laughs> no, no. And I mean, like everybody is different and everybody is beautiful and all of that. But um, then uh, growing up, like I went to Stearns Elementary School here in Pittsfield and um, all the, yeah. And all the <laughs> lunch ladies were like, you said model. And I was like, models are dumb. <laughs> So silly, Chelsea. So I'm so wrong. It's such a <laughs> it's such a hard job, but it's so I get to bring acting into it and vice versa with acting. Um, and you have to have really tough skin, but that's kind of I fell into that, didn't really want to do it, um, was against it. <laughs> and then it wound up being my day job. So so how then there must have been a first one or there must have been an instance where you yeah. had that decision. Yeah. Well, it was, it was like, I was, I had done some things. I had freelanced, I'd worked for friends. I had been with a couple different agencies. And then in 2013, um, in 2013, We Speak Models was started by my friend Brianna, who I actually met at a nightclub in the city. And, um, and she was like, I'm thinking of starting a modeling agency that it's like body diversity and blah, blah, blah. Um, she was like, and you're perfect. You have bangs, you have a gap tooth, you're a size six. This is great. Like, do you want to be? And so I became one of the original six models with them and I've been with them ever since. So you've always had bangs? No, I think I got them that year. Okay. But I, I got them. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know why that's. (laughs) You always had bangs? Because bangs can change, you know, you don't. Yeah. No. I mean, the teeth. I mean, that's. The teeth. Well, that's that's because I stopped wearing my Invisalign. (laughs) 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 That's it. But now my dentist is like, do you want to fix the, the gap in your teeth? I'm like, no, I get money. <laughs> um, I get booked because of the bangs. Yeah, like who was that actress? They She had the nose job and then she was Stop never. working. You know, I feel yeah. like that's a lot of actresses. Yeah. 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 So it's but that's like. your look. It's my look. That's what makes you interesting. Yeah. Right? I, the fashion industry has definitely changed. There's a ways to go, but it's been um, it's been really fun being a part of like the revolution of um kind of breaking free from this heroin chic convention they're trying to bring heroin chic back yeah yeah. really just um no and we're like kind of one of the front runners as far as an agency goes just being like nope absolutely yeah i think that uh must have hit its hopefully uh well hit its peak when was it probably maybe early 2000s or early 2000s yeah 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 Yeah. Yeah. and i mean like there are a lot of fantastic models that i know who like just they're built that way I've always had muscle and grew up playing sports here, like any sport you could imagine. And I was like, that's just never, that's never going to be me. There are jobs that have come up where like, I'd had to, I'd have to put on 10 pounds or like lose 20 pounds. And I just, I do it because they pay me to do it. But it was never about like looking a certain way. Um, uh, I mean, like not, never about looking that way, Um, trying to be too thin. It was, that's, that has mainly been, acting roles not even modeling being like oh yeah yeah um but I really I love being a model which is just you know growing up I was so adamantly against it because I I think I was five nine by the age of 10 um and um yeah that was rough but (laughs) I'm really grateful for it now yeah it works out in the end usually when you hear those stories (laughs) and I've become more self-aware I don't hit my head on as many things um anymore (laughs) (laughs) um but I I really love I've had some really cool great jobs I love seeing my face on a billboard it's so surreal or then walking into a store and being like that's my face (laughs) that's my face (laughs) this is crazy (laughs) But it's really, it's really great. I've said that it's like the best day job I could possibly ask for. That's cool. You know. So it'd be a, you need a thick skin for it. Oh God, yeah. Why? I mean, there's still, there's still people in the industry who, you know, you go up to this open call. I don't go to open calls anymore. If I'm requested to go to a casting, that um, if it's like a request call, of course I'll go. But um, you know, cattle calls as we call them. Where it's just like, no, you're too fat, you're too skinny, you're too tall, you're too this, your 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 bangs are too long, your your roots are coming in, anything. And they're just um there's been so many instances where um there's been there's been these 14 year old girls who are just like starving themselves and they get told in this cattle call like one little tiny thing and they burst into into tears. Mm. And now I'm like an old model and I um I'm able to just be like, you get you get used to it, kid. It's going to be okay. That doesn't matter. And things are changing. So don't worry about it. Mm. Um, because it's, it's tough and the hours are long. And I mean, you're basically, you know, wearing 
you're a you're a mannequin with emotion <laughs> um and uh but it's really it's really I found it to be beautiful um because every every experience is so different where a photographer or a designer will want you to you know be jumping around not to mama can ever thank god but um <laughs> but um they want you to be jumping around and like flailing your arms about be smiling and some some things are like you know I'll model head headdresses or headpieces and it's everything's in the eyes and everything's like you can move you can move um your chin like seven degrees this way and getting to find the art form of being so specific and so small and making it still so real where where um consumers are going to be like I want to buy that mm. headdress mm. I need that headdress um and that's really been the art of it for me because you don't know until you're going to go on set unless you've heard from like another model or from your agent or whatever that like, oh, you know, please like feel free to be wild and free. And um, some are like, they're they're not strict, but they're very specific on what they want. So your director will tell you exactly what they want, where some directors will just be like, go have fun. Yeah, yeah. How um, do you think technology has, you, uh, so, well, you've been doing this for a dozen years, yeah. essentially after mm -hmm. leaving high school and then yeah. into college and everything. Um, I wonder, since everyone has a high res uh, camera in their pocket, um, so crazy. And how? Because I feel like, um, I mean, obviously, when you get to the higher level of quality, you still need the higher level of quality. But we can take such high quality photos all the time. I I wonder how that's shaped the industry, like maybe how the content has changed or mm -hmm. even in filmmaking too. That's a whole nother, a whole know, other like uh, iPhone, like film festival awards yeah. and stuff. And I'm like, what? um, I mean, has it, has it sort of democratized things a little bit or it has, I think that like, you know, a lot of people, they want to go to film school. Their folks can't afford to put them through film school. They have this beautiful device that can help them become a filmmaker, a photographer without having to go and have, your parents or buy you some fancy camera or having to save up by yourself, like, especially for teenagers and stuff in underprivileged areas. Um, I think that it's, it's really fantastic and how it's kind of, um, how I think it's, I've seen things change is that of course, if you're on a bigger set, you're never going to use an iPhone. I no, mean, like, course. I can't remember the last <laughs> time that I was on a set where the camera was an iPhone. It was a long time ago, um, but, but it was that, done. It did. It did happen. <laughs> it, it did happen. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but I think that it's kind of brought as far as filmmaking goes, like it's brought back kind of older types of cameras. And I think this even like started happening when film cameras had come out, like the new like the 4K and the 8K where you feel like you could just grab the people on the screen. Mm. A lot of people don't like that. So they want this old, like, I know that for my, my Macbeth movie and for the booth, the confession of John Wilkes Booth, we wanted an older camera to make it feel like you're watching mm. something that's old. Um, so I've seen a resurgence of people shooting on eight millimeter. Yeah, even see filters on TikTok and stuff where it's like the old VHS, like, oh you know, <laughs> or, or you yeah. know, some other uh, thing like that, because TikTok. people... Uh, what, what about TikTok? Tell me about TikTok. Tick well, I don't know anything about TikTok. You're not on TikTok. No, I'm I'm an Instagrammer. Yes, yeah, yeah, right. Because I make you money a off big of Instagram. Following on Instagram, and I I I enjoy um looking at pretty photos of people, and I like it's really cool because brands that have a cause that I like will reach out to me and throw me some money if I pose in their clothes yeah, or yeah. whatever. That's so how that's, it works. I was gonna ask you, how do yeah. you make money? I do on Instagram. Like, so it's, it's basically, um, uh, the, the, uh, company mm -hmm. will pay you yeah. to put something on your Instagram. It's not necessarily Correct. like through the algorithm or something that Instagram isn't, doesn't have a system that's like paying you. They do. Oh, they, they, they do, do too. Now. Okay. Yeah. They do too. Now, like I have okay. like a subscription, um, where you, like people, it seems really silly. Um, where like you can post content that are just for your subscribers, and really what I put on there is kind of like um, um, no nudes. It's um, <laughs> it's um, it's not, <laughs> it's not like that. I mean, maybe it is for other people, but it's um, it's like behind the scenes of horror movies or like gotcha. You know, I'm waiting to go. I'm waiting to. I'm backstage waiting to go on stage in this Alice again play or like things like that. Um. Uh, so there's that. And then people love reels now. Yeah, they're a big deal. I hate them. 
I'm sorry. Why? I just, I, I don't know. I mean, because well, the, people... the thing I like about them, yeah, Chelsea, I like that <laughs> is because they're they have an organic reach that reaches outside your following. That's that's yeah. that to me, as far as the actual. I mean, it's basically TikTok. It's basically TikTok. I think that's the reason. <laughs> so you can make money. The content is TikTok, but it's yeah, it, it allows other people to see your stuff that's outside your followers. That's true. I mean, and you can make money. Instagram will pay money for reels mm-hmm. too if you like post a certain amount. And I just am like, I have what? <laughs> um, but the, uh, but because there's people who are just Instagram models, you know, and I think that it's never hurt my soul more than when someone called me an Instagram model, and I was like, no, this is my job. Now, do you? Are you? <laughs> I, I don't, I'm sure there's no fear, but the idea that someday Instagram may just disappear, does that, and I'm not saying it will, but, yeah. but you know, some people think Twitter is going to disappear pretty soon, right, right. Uh, for example, um, you know, being so tied to one platform, um, is that, is that something you think about at all? <laughs> <laughs> honestly like <laughs> my manager's gonna kill me for saying this yeah. but i hope it's instagram goes away it eats up so much of my yeah, life yeah yeah it eats up, i mean i have like an instagram manager who like filters all out like all these horrible photos that men send me and like um kind of sifts <laughs> yeah um sift through um uh like what job offers are best and it's just but so i'm paying my instagram manager and then i just i'm constantly on instagram i hope it goes away because i want a break um that's interesting <laughs> um but no i mean i mean the, you ever just thought of taking an instagram break like i mean or oh my it caused me i think it was earlier this year maybe it was last year that instagram like like crapped out mm-hmm. for like a day mm-hmm. and we all, all of us millennials, thought that we were going to die. <laughs> um, <laughs> we did. We just like, what are we? I'd be like pulling up my phone, and I just, I'd go and I'd open the Instagram app and be like, it's not working. <laughs> um, so that was traumatizing. But the amount of anxiety, <laughs> the amount of anxiety that it caused all of us, kind of made us take a look and like a sit back, even for a, just a moment, and be like. Yeah, we have well, a problem. I, I don't think. Well, I don't think it's millennials. I think it's uh, it's, it's everyone. It's yeah. It's uh, it, it, because people love to point and say, "Oh, that younger generation, they're tied to their phones." That's that's baloney. I mean, they're every 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 generation. You're right. This coffee is very good. It's currency coffee, baby. <laughs> it's the best there is. It's very very. Uh, good. Tell your friends. Tell your oh, friends. It's amazing. <laughs> This is wonderful. Um, We're going to have to tag them and tag them and make sure that that happens. That happens. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. You deserve it. Free coffee for life for Free Chelsea Lesage. Oh, yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> I uh, Are you a coffee drinker? Is that? I mean, like, I'll drink it if it's given to me. If I'm on set, then I need it. I Well, yeah. I wonder, like, it, it must be these people that go. Is Starbucks coffee more expensive in New York City than it is in Here? Yeah. Pittsfield? Everything is. I mean, yeah. I mean, I figured it is, <laughs> but I didn't know if it was like five dollars for a cup of coffee versus three. Or I mean, it, God, three dollars for a cup of coffee doesn't really exist in New York. Are you kidding me? I think if you want like a tall, it'll be like four fifty-five dollars. If you want like the big one, it's going to cost you like seven bucks. The yeah. what is that? The, the venti, the like, <laughs> big one. Do you ever? Not big one. What is that clip? I forgot who the actor is, but they're like venti is not large and like it's just yeah yeah it, yeah it, yeah that whole it's thing. so it's so that's, silly. I'm not a, I'm not a Starbucks fan. I will never get sponsored by Starbucks. I did audition for it's them. It's too once, harsh. So. Yeah. It's just it's um I don't I just don't there's no smoothness. There's no smoothness to the <laughs> disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, uh, uh, no, I'm like I'm like a um I mean from. Pittsfield, so I have to just Duncan through and through, you know. They have Duncans in New York City. They do, they do. And is like, that a new phenomenon or exactly? So when I the... first moved there, there was maybe one Duncan for fourteen Starbucks. People don't realize that. Yeah, like if you're from here and you go to like Colorado, you know, like oh, where's the Duncan, you know, or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, they're not out there. Maybe, yeah, no. maybe they are now. I don't know. No, but, it's but, definitely, you know. I mean, like 18 year old Chelsea definitely noticed a, a stark lack of my Duncan. <laughs> a dearth. A dearth. <laughs> An abyss. Um, but they're definitely, they're they're out there. But like if you go into Grand Central Station, you um, hit two Starbucks before you hit a Duncan, but you hit a Duncan within a block. 
is that what it is? Is it like two Starbucks for every Dunkin? Well, or... which is better than like one Dunkin to fourteen Starbucks. <laughs> I yeah, I don't, I don't. Do you know that math? That's good I math do. right there. I do. <laughs> I did math. Oh my god, mom, I did math. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I like coffee if I'm working, but then if I'm like Chelsea, you're always working. Um, the, the, but if I'm just home, no, I don't, I'm not someone who needs it Yeah. in order to survive. Grounding. Oh. Do, you, do you, do, you, do, uh, it's, it's gotta be tough. So there's just grounding. Grounding. Is, you know, you go out and you take your shoes Central off. Park exists. Yep. That, so is that, is that something you partake in? Yeah. Often? My mother uh, being makes... from the Berkshires, yeah. I can't imagine this, this concrete playground out there, asphalt and concrete. Mm-hmm. But you got to find some. Yeah. My mother nature. has always talked about how like she's like, Chelsea, you every place that you've lived in the city, you have been next to a park or mm-hmm. the water or grass. It's like you just don't want to let go mm-hmm. of nature. And I'm like, I didn't even realize that. Right. It's, it's true. Like I've lived on Central Park. My favorite place I lived in the city was um, Roosevelt Island, which is right um, underneath the 59th Street Bridge. And it's like um, you can't drive there from Manhattan. There's a tram that goes over the water. Um, You can drive in from Queens, but the island belongs to Manhattan. And it's the most beautiful view of the skyline you're mm. ever going to see in your mm. entire life. And that, of course, there was grass everywhere. And you're right in the middle of the East River. So even though it was polluted, um, I could wake up and look at my favorite city in the world and smell the ocean. Mm. Um, it's amazing. It was really I would like to move back there someday. Um, but now it's a college town because Cornell moved over there. Cornell. Yeah. Cornell, what, what what Cornell moved over there? And yeah, there's like there's like some hospital and then um, oh. like a medical program like, like Cornell students. University, yeah. in Ithaca, yeah, has a a, yeah. a foothold in New York City. In in on Roosevelt Island, I'm like, get off my island. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's irritating. <laughs> it is irritating because when I lived there, when I lived there, I was a, um, a sophomore in college through like the second year um, after I graduated, and I was like the only was the youngest person there and I loved it. Did you see over time a decade or so gentrification everywhere? It's everywhere. How bad did it get or how or how bad has it gotten? Or, or tell me or actually going from point A to yeah. today, uh what what did you see? I mean like I can't imagine how it is for people who like grew up in these neighborhoods that are now being um kind of forced out of it because um uh rich kids parents now can't or um rich kids parents now can't afford to buy them a place down in the east or west village so they're going to harlem instead and now people who've always lived there can't afford to live there Mm. um so i've been a part of the problem um i know that um my parents aren't rich i'm wishing it for you guys though i really am (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I mean, yeah you're a little bit of a different story you're yes. not just like you know some you know, uh, yeah yeah th- these these parents who live in uh you know up just in connecticut or whatever yeah, those yeah. Ca- rich, rich counties and the kids are going to new york city to play around for a while you know be, until they be give a, up an actor or 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 whatever you know no. you're you're I'm a I different was, story in a far different category than yes that. Yeah, yes yeah. thank you john <laughs> um yeah no but it's definitely it's um I've definitely seen it everywhere. Mm. Um, I guess that, you know, my most, I lived in Harlem um, on 105th Street and 5th Avenue. So it was great because I lived right on Central Park. It was great for my dogs. And um, your dogs? I do. Wow. I do. So you just. <laughs> I'm crazy. What kind of dogs do you have? I have a poodle and a chihuahua. So I'm the biggest cliche in the entire world. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm aware of this, and Why I accept did it. You, you should have brought the poodle on the show here. Should have brought the poodle, or, yeah, or the other one. Was it was the other one again? Uh, a chihuahua. So yeah, I'm that, an actress a... with a poodle and a chihuahua. Okay, so you're like Paris Hilton and um, and and another. She has the chihuahua, right? Or you I think so. I, I don't know. I don't know about. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like I'm gonna Google it. I love Paris the Hilton. Google. It's so 1998 or something like that. I don't no, know. Paris. Paris is forever. <laughs> I wonder how she's doing. <laughs> I don't think about her much anymore, but I hope she's doing very well. Um, uh, yeah, no. So, but I noticed that like everyone else who, when I first moved into that building, you know, my roommate Gina and I were like, you know, the white artists, the young white artists who were living in that building, and then slowly over time, the whole building became that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I was like, I am so sorry. Yeah. Um. Well, it's not your fault. But I'm part it's of not the your, problem. Yeah, you could be, but I mean, 
I mean, that's the thing. I look at these things and, you know, you're part of the problem, but, you know, there's a system that we've created. Yeah. It's not, you know, mm-hmm. it's not any one person's fault, uh, you know, and I, and I think, I think a lot of times society wants to, again, point the finger and say, yeah. oh, it's your fault. You, you know, but no, we have, we have, a, we have a society that's set up a certain way and, you know, they're much bigger, powerful players it is true. who, uh, then they're the ones who get to say, oh, you guys, you should guys blame each other. Yeah. Well, did you know that millennials can't buy property because we buy too much avocado toast? So, right. you know, that's that's, right. yeah, yeah. That's our fault. It's like, you know, your coffee's <laughs> too expensive. I always love that. Unbelievable. Yeah. I'm Unbelievable. like, uh, you can't buy a house because you're spending 30 extra bucks a month on coffee or something like I that. I do like, love my avocado toast. What a, what a f- that is. Man. I know. It's just I know. like, I know. <laughs> that's bad that's bad it is but that's i i don't know manhattan's definitely definitely changed it has nothing to do with the fact that like you know wages are oh, yeah. you know have never kept up with inflation for the last 50 years no. i mean come on it has nothing Get to do with here. the fact that we are not helped at all by yeah. by by like these giant corporations and, are, and everyone nowadays is just made to fail yeah so yeah yeah. They want us in debt. They want us. All we need to do other. is make there, more. There Insta- you're saying, yes. <laughs> you just have to make more Instagram reels and everything's going to be fine. Everything will be fine. Everything's fine. Just keep watching your Instagram. <laughs> we just got real cynical real quick. Kelsey. <laughs> I live in this space. <laughs> <laughs> But that's again, again, that's like how New York City it hardens you. You, you, but I don't think that I'd have half the success that I have now if it didn't do that. Yeah, but that's yeah. why owning your own situation, yeah, is the way to go. And and while you still can do that in this society, <laughs> run your own place, man, because then, because yeah. then you can control it. You know, you can you can work the deals, you can negotiate, you can get the the you know money coming in and you decide right. how the money goes out you know no it's totally and having my own production companies has definitely like helped me when i'm on bigger sets through my modeling agency or like through my manager through my agent um like it's helped me kind of stand up for what i want because now that i'm so many other people's boss mm-hmm. i can stand up for myself when i have bosses on a set um not that i've needed to but make sure that this thing is taken care of um, do you have an idea when we're going to wrap? No, you don't. Okay. Do you have overtime? Are you giving me an Uber back home? Um, things like that where if I hadn't started my own businesses, I don't think that it, it would have slowed down the process of me being like, I, these are basic needs that are yeah. things that I need to know. Taking control. Taking control. That's right. Yes. Damn it. I love that. No, it is. It, it, I mean... It's true. <laughs> <laughs> You're funny. I Thank you. <laughs> But all these things. For, I mean, I, I know I say it sounds like a cliche. You're taking control, but but the thing is, it's true. It is awesome being a small business owner. Yeah. You know, it's scary. Uh, it can be, but um, but those things um are amazing skills to have. Uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, for I wouldn't sure. trade it for anything. Yeah. yeah, maybe cheaper coffee. Trade it for cheaper coffee. <laughs> well, you well, can write it off. Go ahead, see coffee. <laughs> you can buy your coffee through your business. And, I do. And, I have. I have written it, it off. There you go. I have. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Amazing the stuff you can write off. I know. Uh, it's right. so wild. Like my headshots. I'm like, oh yeah, this is great. That's right. Gas. That's right. It's a business expense. Love it. It's a business, business expense. I love it. Yep. Look, this is wonderful. Listen, I think this, we, we should do a whole podcast on the stuff you can write off. The business <laughs> of acting and small and how how to run your own small business. Yeah. So yeah. that's good. So <laughs> when when is the surgery? December 14th. Okay. So you're going to be in town. I'm going to be uh, in town for a while. So everybody call up Chelsea, you know, it's uh, even, well, come help her, yes. you know, <laughs> give her mom a break. <laughs> give my mom a break. Pity me. Just are, you, gonna... <laughs> are you in touch with a lot of the high school friends at all? Um, I actually was at Thistle and Mirth the other day. And then all of a sudden it was like everyone from every walk of my life. And I was yeah. like, this is crazy. This is crazy. No, but it was, it was, was really it the fun. Wednesday? It was the night before Thanksgiving or no, I don't, I don't go out on those nights because I remember once That's I was much. home and I went out to Heritage and Lennox on a Wednesday night. Don't remember getting home. So I was like, we, I don't go out the day before Thanksgiving anymore. Um, but I think <laughs> when was it? Friday. Friday. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. This is the traditional time. Everybody comes home. And, oh yeah. So, that, uh, but I do keep in touch. I have like some really good friends who've been my friends since kindergarten or since like middle school. Yeah. I got out, I got out and I've been very, very lucky to have, like I said, like the upbringing that I had, but also the friends that I've had and kept in mm-hmm. touch with the ones from here, which is yeah. great. Like I went on a hike with Courtney Booth. She's my best friend growing yeah. up. We like went on a hike in the rain the other day and it was just so great. It was so great. I'm like not telling 
my orthopedic surgeon that I'm hiking. Um, <laughs> is he, is he saying that you're not supposed to, or I, I almost yeah. think that like, aren't you supposed to do a little bit like more to strengthen, you know, do some, it's like, well, they, it's, they call, it's call completely prehab, obliterated. Right? Yeah. It's completely obliterated. So there's no hope of like regain, like yeah. getting it. So better. it really doesn't matter what you do right now. <laughs> I know exactly. <laughs> exactly. I was like, I feel like I've, I've two weeks to live. Um, <laughs> I'm going to live my life. Live it to the fullest. Yeah. So I, I would love, I would love um, any, you know, Netflix recommendations. There you go. It's going to be like, ma'am, are there new horror movies coming? <laughs> ma'am. Really? Do, you, do you watch horror? Is that, we did. I don't watch horror movies. Yeah. They scare me. I don't, I don't, oh, I don't. Watch <laughs> That's sweet. That's so sweet. I just, I don't, I don't, I just. I don't watch anything I do. Then. <laughs> Macbeth is calm. I just go crazy yeah. at the end. Macbeth, the cursed can't film everyone. Um, the, but yeah, no, we watched some horror movie last night that was really great. And then the night before that, or no, two nights before that, we watched Smile is now out on Paramount Plus. I don't know. I, so please. Wait, didn't they? Um, okay, so there's uh, a new film with Winnie the Pooh where. Oh my God, Winnie I can't. Pooh I can't wait to see it. Is... Like, what is that? Like, it's like evil Winnie the Pooh. Yeah, like a. Whole, like well, a... He just went into the public domain that whole all those characters really did. yeah okay. so so disney's not making it or no. okay so it's another it's like i have to google this yeah you gotta google it i'll because... put it on my list of things to do well it, yes. yeah so that's kind of an interesting traumatic potentially it's, thing. it's, it's gonna be so terrible <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. i'm not um... really excited about it i am i am <laughs> Thank you for reminding me that that exists. Yeah, that's what I'm hearing. I'm hearing big things about the horror. About the horror the genre. <laughs> yeah, so any any good recommendations, please, anyone let me know. Send along the Netflix uh, recommendations. Can... Um, what about, uh, I mean, do you like, do Amazon Prime? Yeah, or... yeah. Okay, so do you, do you it, how, what is your, is this like research for you when you watch, watch films? Like, how do you watch a film? Because I'm sure for an yeah. actor, it must be a little bit, different but then at some point you have to suspend disbelief and you're just enjoying like anybody else but you know is it different it's, it's, it's definitely different i mean like as an actor but even more so as a filmmaker like as someone who like comes in with pre-production storyboards and you go through all the production and post-production and distribution so i see i oversee all of those steps so that's the difficult part that i have trouble just kind of sometimes letting myself enjoy a film um because I'll be like, and that audio wasn't mixed right, or um, <laughs> or you know, you could have gone to this angle instead. And I'm very, I'm a very firm believer in like, don't talk poorly about anything unless like, no matter what it is. Like, I don't like this music artist. I don't like this person. This person sucks. I'm like, don't say those things unless you can do better. Um, if you like actually think you can do better, so someone will be talking about how like I don't particularly love country music, but I'm not going to talk poorly about it because I can't do it better than those people are. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's the same with these movies, where of course if it's like a ten million dollar, or no, no, I mean like uh, if it's a fifty million dollar movie, I'm not going to say even if I notice little problems, I'm not going to say anything because I don't have fifty million dollars to do better. <laughs> um, right. Right, but right. there'll be jump cuts so there'll be you know audio mixing is wrong or or i'm like there's some sort of continuity error and i'm like no i don't yeah, people because they think you know with the technology we can do so much in, in it but it takes time oh my god and so that's where i think that's what the 50 million dollars is i mean yes equipment for sure but the 50 million dollars is about like over a two-hour film um and then all the footage that that you start with before you get it all the way down yeah. to two hours or whatever it may be is just time and people's, it's so much time. Yeah, people's time, and of course the high, the more money you have, the like more expensive people you get yeah. for the project, and that can like speed up time, like with video editors, VFX people. Um, but yeah, no, it's hard. But I'll tell you, the movies that I have watched since I have been in Pittsfield the past couple of days, I have not complained about. Okay, which is good. It's good. This is great. <laughs> it's wonderful. And I'm sure I will. But it's different. I'm sure this is Winnie the Pooh slasher movie. <laughs> Just saying that out loud is completely <laughs> absurd. I am sure that I will, that I won't have take issue with that because the whole thing is just absolutely bananas. Yeah. Um, the whole idea. But, you know, and I'm, 
you learn to, of course, like being in this industry, you're your own worst critic or hardest critic where I don't like to watch things that I'm in. Mm. Um, I was in, I had a screening of the confession of John Wilkes Booth um, the other day and I was, and I had to do a Q and A as the director afterwards, but I'm in it as well. And I was like, Oh no, I have to, <laughs> I'm like whiskey, please. Someone give me alcohol because I have to Is watch. it painful for you to watch yourself? Yeah. I just like, I'm what, what about it? Is it just like, just overall like a cringy especially when it's things that i've been there in the editing room too mm. and i've like chosen the what i think is the best footage for the film um i've seen it a million times and then also i'm forced to watch myself all the time so it's not like i want to just go saying i'm forced i'm not like tied to a chair in a theater <laughs> but um but you know i have to That's go an interesting to... storyline though it is actually <laughs> i'm gonna write that down <laughs> Do you want to be in it, John Quill? <laughs> <laughs> um, the um, what you call it? The because I have to go to these premieres and I love it. I love it very much to a certain extent. The mm-hmm. and the Q and A people asking about the making of the movie afterward. That's great. I love it, but I have to watch the movie in between. Mm-hmm. And so I kind of I don't sit down and be like I'm going to watch everything that I've ever made, <laughs> anything that I'm ever in. I don't. I just don't do it. Yeah. 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 It it's, almost feels like work more than actually making it is. The film. It is. I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, for sure. I've edited a lot of audio yeah, I bet. <laughs> and video with me in it. And uh, you're going to like edit out the squeak of the chair and me throwing my phone or sipping the coffee. I'm not editing any of that. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking we keep it that. real here. I was thinking about it because I, I, had, I had two podcasts with Charles Lincoln called Charles and Chelsea's um, Cinematic Autopsy, which are we like, um, uh, pick apart movies um you can listen to that anywhere and then um we had a women's wrestling podcast too and i felt so bad a women's wrestling podcast yeah yeah i stopped doing it but it was called chelsea and charles beyond the bell wait, wait, wait. so as a as a analyst of women's wrestling yeah or okay yeah i mean like well he's more so the expert i kind of i had never watched wrestling and then just became hooked um really <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you were thinking. Well, now with your torn ACL, I know, I know. There um, was a time where Charles was like, "Let me be your wrestling manager." I was like, "I am tough enough, and I'm strong enough. I could do this. I could do this. I could be the female version of The Rock. I could do this. I don't want to do that. It's not your thing. <laughs> it's not my thing. But yeah, no. But I feel I always felt bad for him because he edited the podcast and he'd be like you were moving you coughed <laughs> you were so loud <laughs> and i'm like not my problem yeah. but i would feel bad for you <laughs> having to edit no all this stuff. well th- this is the easiest edit i've ever done because to be honest with you it's just really? i mean it's all it's all real we just keep it pretty raw i mean i throw some music in at the end you Beautiful. know just, like, break up the segments whatever just to kind of break it up a little bit but no we keep it that's great. Sponsored by real. Currency Coffee. That's right. That's yeah, right. Man, currency. The, I, the money better start coming in from currency. I'll tell you. For real. Yeah. For you know, with 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 the check mark. With the check mark from Chelsea Lacey. <laughs> yes. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> currency Coffee. It's like a jingle. Ooh, the official oh. choice of the John Crowell podcast. <laughs> <laughs> We've got this in the bag. This we is actually it. really good because I don't like cream or sugar and. and you know, John was nervous that it was going to be too strong. It's perfect. It's perfect. I mean, but now I feel like I'm bouncing off the walls. Yeah, I'm like, you... let's go for five more hours. <laughs> You're like, screw this ACL. Well, yeah, I'm right. going to do this for five more hours and I'm going to go to hike. Yeah, no, at, I'm going to uh, walk back to New Kennedy York City. Park and I'm going to walk. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to run back to New York City. Back. Dogs and chill. <laughs> Yeah. Ah, uh, man, that currency coffee is powerful stuff. That's great. <laughs> I'm gonna show up there like on crutches and be like, "Did you sponsor him yet?" <laughs> like, did you... I have I'm this crutch, and I know and I, I will not it. leave until will not. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I make scary movies, but I can be scary in life too. That's right. Uh, yeah, I'm not just scary in movies. Well, I'm glad that we've had absolutely no fun doing this. <laughs> I love it. So, um, yeah, I know you. I got you got a deadline here, so we should wrap up pretty soon. But, um, yes. but, pe- but, <laughs> but people um, got to know, man. You're from Pittsfield, and uh, and you're and you're making it. And making you know, it. and like there, you know, like there's a couple others out there. You yeah. know, uh, I don't know if you were in touch with them, but um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I tried. So, so uh, Caroline Fairweather. Oh yeah, Caroline. Yeah, like, we are. She auditioned for Stag and Lion Theater Company. Actually, um, cool. yeah, I was like, what. Yeah. And she, I had my 30th birthday party at the theater and she came and it was really sweet. She's a good kid. Yeah. I mean, she's a grown up now, but she will always be 14 to me, <laughs> you know, but no, a lot of talent on that girl. 
Yeah, for sure. That's good stuff. That's yeah, good stuff. So that's the other one. I mean, we interviewed her. I interviewed her. Um, yeah, a little while ago. Yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, it is. It's that generation, and that. But <clears throat> I think you would have been in New York City whether there was a Jess Pacetto or whether there was. I mean, a, I don't you know. know. It's kind of all Jess's fault. Thank really? you, Jess. Well, I, I wouldn't have done. I mean, if it weren't for the Fall Festival of Shakespeare, and then being like, oh, I can sing. Why don't I join the choir? Wait, I want to be in the spring musical. But it was definitely, I mean, like between, like I said, Santa Broder, Bill Chapman, Cara Demler, and Jess Pacetto kind of being the god of all of them. Um, I don't know. Because it's true that like the, it was the golden era of Taconic Theater. And it was all because of her. I don't know if I would have like, I probably would still have tried to become an actor, but theater wouldn't have been the focus if it weren't for her. Mm-hmm. I would have been like, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe just conf- like composing movies for, or composing scores for movies. I, I there's no way of knowing, but I know it's a, I owe it a lot to her. Yeah, that's and, a whole other aspect. We didn't, we didn't, I mean, yeah. um, we didn't explore too much that music side. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> You're you're like I'm good I'm good but you're a hell of a musician thank and you if you're you know composing scores and all and um, yeah. but well I played the clarinet and then was like I want to learn the guitar the banjo piano and a bunch of other you stuff. the banjo I can play the banjo Jesus and the bassoon <laughs> and, and I know the... people think oh well the banjo no the banjo has different uh, number of strings mm-hmm. than a guitar it's mm-hmm. it's definitely a different animal and I have a banjo lately now and that's very exciting wow yeah. And really? where do you play those? Do you play that like in, in my uh, apartment? Do you, and how, how are have, people? Yeah, yeah. Are they are they okay? Are they soft string? <laughs> well, I have a duplex in a soundproof room, so my office is oh, upstairs. Okay. okay. Yeah, I got lucky. Okay, I so did. <laughs> <laughs> I have no, I, nobody's taking their broom and like you know hammering. Oh no, that on, has on happened. the ceiling. Yeah, yeah. that has happened because I shoot in order to like save money on these indie like on these independent productions where our budget's only like a hundred thousand dollars or something i'll be like let's just shoot in my apartment you know it'll be easier and i can kick you out when i want um <laughs> but no that has happened we actually had the cops called on us once because we we're murdering someone um and they, they they probably thought it was real they right? did think it was real yeah. i was like this actress deserves a raise yeah yeah she, it was realistic. very convincing <laughs> very convincing um yeah no life is good well yeah chelsea i'll let you get off your your deadline but it was a great pleasure you. love your energy yeah. love your energy i know we've been <laughs> we've been probably talking for months yeah try to get you back here and unfortunately maybe it's the acl injury that got you back here i know right and and, and thanksgiving of course thanksgiving but um but uh, good luck with the Thank surgery you. Thank um you. i know and we'll we'll be hoping that you heal very very quickly yeah and uh get back at it once it's <laughs> oh yeah i got too much to do too much to do awesome yeah, thank you awesome. john well good seeing you thank you